lot of conservatives or maybe right-leaning people, whatever that even means anymore, are so paranoid about being perceived as racist that as soon as a black person comes along and you know says anything that that makes sense to them, they're like, see, we like him. That's us. He's part of us. See, we're not, we're not racist because we like this guy. Hey everybody, welcome to Break the Rules in New York City. I am your host, Lev Polyakov, and we are here today with the astounding, the wonderful Clifton Duncan, the man who is fighting the establishment when it comes to theater and the woke policies that uh, a lot of people have been enduring in silence, in buried silence, because a lot of the theater people don't like speaking about this stuff. And not only that, but you're going to be doing a fundraiser now for a play about Thomas Sowell, and we're going to get into all of that, especially when it comes to the nitty gritty of what exactly it means to be a personality who is at the forefront right now of challenging the stagnation of the arts. Uh, Clifton, for those who don't know, just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You were born in Germany. Uh, you were driven into the world of theater uh, by uh, a certain kind of inspiration. And when it came to how you got canceled and all of that, uh, I would love for you to uh, expand on it. So uh, all the people who are watching, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, click the bell, and also patreon.com slash break the rules, become a patron today, and you're going to get exclusive uh, special videos. Anyway, Clifton, uh, take it away, my friend. All righty. Well, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction, Lev. Um, I'm exhausted. Just, you know, for those who don't know, Lev's setup is, is pretty awesome, but uh, it took a lot of work to get to get this level of perfection. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, my name is uh, Clifton and I am, or was, I don't know, maybe I still am an actor and uh, I'm a military brat, as you uh, pointed out. So I've lived on both, in both hemispheres. Um, but I was gonna be, I was an artsy fartsy kid and uh, I thought I was gonna be an illustrator. You know, I was, I was mainly drawing, you know, and I liked reading comics like Calvin and Hobbes. Um, I was a big fan of comic books. Um, so artists like Jim Lee and that kind of, or Andy Kubert, you know, they really were big inspirations. Um, and also dabbled in like short stories and uh, poetry and things like that. And um, you mentioned I had some big inspiration to get into acting. I mean, it, it wasn't, it was a girl. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's, I think that's how most straight no, guys that's, get No, that's the theater. biggest inspiration. We were having a show uh, the other time with uh, Jason Reziger Johnny, this philosopher, and he was yeah. talking about how uh, Plato wrote about Socrates' biggest uh, inspiration and the thing that he worships is Eros. So Eros is considered to be the most important thing for someone who would be regarded as one of the greatest philosophers of all time. So I think that there is something about that sexual energy, this Dionysian uh, nature that appeals to a lot of artists because they see a lot of these very stagnant ways people go about their lives just being entrapped in uh, you know the daily uh, grind and they want to escape from it they want to set it on fire they want to they want to do things that they wouldn't be allowed to do in uh, real life well i mean i mean sex is this primordial force it's it's both terrifying and it's freeing and it's also very a very vulnerable thing and um you know it, it's especially for men it drives just about <laughs> just about all that we do. I'm sorry to say that's our biggest weakness, you know. But yeah, you know, a lot of guys, uh, you know, they, they chase some girl into drama class and they find out, oh, you know, I'm actually good at this. But uh, I, I was taking a French class and um, and much to my teacher's chagrin, she, uh, I was like, yeah, I'm going to switch out for something else. And it wasn't, you know, I wasn't one of those kids who, you know, saw a production of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat when I was like six. And I was like, oh, my God, I have to do this for the rest of my life. Like my life would have been easier if that were the case, but it was cheaper. I got I got accepted into the Savannah College of Art and Design somehow, some way. Um, I think they just wanted tu tuition money, but it was cheaper to go to theater school in state at VCU, and uh, you know, and then I just kept getting into plays there. And like I had no designs on being an actor, but uh, you know, I had a lot of encouragement at a at a very young age. People were like, you know, if you really work hard. This was back in the uh, late 90s, early aughts, when, you know, when Zoomers think everything was like Jim Crow. Yeah. Um, but people were just like, hey, you know, if you really, really work on this, uh, work hard, then you'll be successful. And I went to D.C. for a couple of years, and that's where I first saw, like, professional theater. I, I love D.C. as a theater town. I think it's superior to, Nor to New York in some ways. 
but then I went to uh, NYU, their graduate program, which is one of the big three, the other two being uh, Juilliard, AKA Jail Yard, or <laughs> Yale School of Drama, AKA the Jail School of Trauma. And um, I got out in 09, and I did a lot of what's called regional theater, which is where you, you, know, you do the big venues at, uh, at, uh, in different states around the country. And finally, my agents were like, please, for the love of God, stay in New York. And so I did. And eventually I climbed my way off Broadway, then onto Broadway. And then 2017 was a really big year in terms of everything kind of shifting all at once in a weird way. And I found myself working with all these stars and then doing television and things like that. And it was like, finally, you know, things are because basically what happens is that, you know, you're you. I went to a great conservatory, which gave me a leg up in the industry, but it's still like, you know, take a number, get in line, be patient, and wait, yeah. wait your turn, basically. You know, there's a British actor who once said, let sooner or later, all your competition just dies, because what happens is, you know, yeah, you know, you need, I don't, you, I don't like to use the word talent, but, you know, it's, it's a word everyone recognizes, so, you know, talent is important. It'll keep you in the game, and, but it won't necessarily get you in the door. Um, that is just a matter of patience and timing often, you know, and building relationships over and networking over time and, and being consistent. Um, but suddenly 2017, it was like, wow, like, you know, I'm just coming out of nowhere getting all these great jobs. I had one actress who was like, how come you get, you're getting so many, you're getting so many jobs. I'm like, why aren't you at your therapist? I don't know. Like, you know, like don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm just doing me, you know? Um, so then 2020 came by and, uh, everything shut down and for the first few months of 2020 i was totally on board i mean i was ahead of the game in a way like i was i was basically prepping and uh, i was sending my friends all these uh, you know annoying statistics you're wearing uh, the gas mask and all that bro I, I i know my roommate had to think i was insane because i you know i'm like manically sanitizing every nook and cranny every knob and like handle in the in the apartment i'm wearing you know <laughs> i'm wearing goggles and uh, and a mask and gloves in the apartment, you know. It was hilarious because people were actually making fun of me um, for masking and, and wearing gloves, like, you know, out in public. Yeah. I thought it was insane. Like, I remember this one dude, I was by Columbus Circle, and I was heading into the subway, and this dude sees me with the mask on. He was like, the ones that's wearing the mask, they must be the ones that got it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then of course a month later they became these life-saving devices. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now we still have people uh, out in the streets uh, wearing them and double eared and uh, yeah. And, yeah. and in general, like say whatever you want about you know the uh, the uh, Chinese delicacy. That's another way of uh, <laughs> f phrasing it. But uh, when it comes to the people who get into that kind of mania, I think it almost becomes a security a device for them because it helps shield their face from judgment of the rest of humanity. Like, I really do think a lot of people end up getting incredibly self-conscious, judging themselves all the time, and just feeling a sense of inadequacy. And this is also one of the things that... Um, the uh, late uh, Ted Kaczynski was talking about uh, the Unabomber when it comes to uh, leftism, that a lot of uh, leftist-oriented people have this sense of a lack of self-worth, and they end up projecting it on everything around them. And I know this kind of uh, jumps to the uh, later part of what you were experiencing when it came to uh, getting canceled, not just for opposing the uh, Chinese delicacy regime, but also your uh, thoughts on what's going on on Broadway in general. Well, you know, it's um, going back to the whole uh, face covering thing. You know, I, re I remember for myself, there's an aspect of, you know, you're, you're able to hide, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's also fun to just be able to, to, to talk trash about people and they have no way of knowing, you know, what, what you're saying. Um, but there's also the aspect of I am, at least early on before masking became like the thing. For me, part of it was like, well, I have this knowledge that nobody else has. Mm. And I'm actually doing the right thing. And... Um, you know, I'm so I'm a part of that club who is like doing the right thing and who is knowledgeable and who is smart, which totally, you know, f I think slots into this idea that a lot of these people who are of this ideology have about themselves as being smarter and better and more empathetic and more caring and more well read and more uh, literate in these kinds of things. Um, I think it's interesting because in the arts um, specifically, um, and I think particularly in the performing arts, you know, you mentioned this idea of like low self-esteem yeah. basically and uh, these kinds of industries um, at least in my experience they do tend to attract more damaged people I mean one of the 
great lines in the musical Chicago if you've never seen it before. Then one of the best lines in that show is about you know how we get into show business because our mommies didn't love us enough. Mm. And yeah. there is an aspect of you know especially if you're an actor, I mean you you want to be seen. The trick is of course you know to want to be seen versus to yeah. need to be seen. You know what I mean? There, there's there's a there's a, a difference there, but. I think there is something about, um, and if you're an artist and you're you're more open than the general population, you're more sensitive about things. Um, I mean, Rick Rubin talks about this, like everything hurts. So when you see these artists, these singers, these actors or whatever, who are standing up for their causes or whatever, like, yes, they're true believers, but it's also because for them, it touches off some emotional, some aspect of their emotional center, which is larger than the general population, which is why they go into these fields in the first place. But of course, the issue with that is that, you know, you, that's why you see people, you know, talking to and about actors, you know, oh, you're amazing. Oh, you're so great. You know, they kind of handle people with kid gloves just because, you know, you're dealing with a, a human being who's actually quite fragile. It's it's a weird sort of dichotomy where for the art and the craft, you have to be soft and open. But for the business, you have to have a thick, thick skin. And so that's why so many people are crazy. <laughs> and, and, you know, yeah. it leads into, you know, I think it lends itself into um, why the industry, entertainment industry reacted so in such an extreme fashion to... Um, to the Chinese delicacy, as you as you've so memorably put it. Well, when it comes to the liberalism of acting versus the conservatism that we're seeing today, let's say with the shows that the Daily Wire wants to do right now and other conservative outlets, they say, "Well, we're taking the art, you know, uh, back from the lefties." But some of the stuff that I've seen, you know, not to hate on the Daily Wire or anything like that, but a lot of it also seems to be very geared to very specific conservative boomers, whatever you want to call it, where they're not really doing anything artistic. They're just repeating their talking points in such a way as to get more clicks. And I've at least found that when it comes to theater, yeah, you're going to have a lot of leftists there, but in general, it's always been a very liberal environment, and I can't really imagine somebody who is that focused on order and, you know, getting up in the morning uh, like Patrick Bateman, you know, putting the mask on and uh, doing all the things you have to do to become a perfect human. I can't imagine somebody like that wanting to engage in this uh, chaos. Yeah, well, that's sort of the difficulty. I mean, you know, I was talking to Winston Marshall about this. He's the ex Mumford mm. & Sons uh, band member. And, uh, you know, he said, like, the problem with outlets like the Daily Wire um, is that it's mainly the, and I haven't seen it, so I'm just, I'm, you know, but I hear the same things over and over again, is that it's just the same thing, but from a different perspective, from the other side of the coin, in, in that it's ideologically driven um, art. And for me, you know, people kind of misconstrue that they'll, they'll say, you know, get art, uh, get politics out of art. I don't think you have to do that. I think, you know, you're going to have your views. My problem is if those like your views can inform the work that you do, but they shouldn't overwhelm the craft. They shouldn't overwhelm the story, you know. And I think when you build a position um, on I'm just going to react to what these people are doing. We're going to, you know, destroy or defeat whatever these people are doing. Own the libs. You're owning, like, owning the libs is not like a, a great place to, to start building anything. And that's why I sort of have, I've moved away. I mentioned this yesterday, but I've been moving away from the whole like politics thing. I mean, I find it really interesting, but as from an artist perspective, it's just not helpful because you want to be open. That's part of the liberal nature of it is more openness, more openness. You know, that's why you see people like, oh, you know, we should have like open borders, like it's literally like a psychological and emotional thing for these people, which is why they go into these fields. And, you know, and I don't ding conservatives for staying away because for me, to me, they just seem like way more pragmatic people. One, it's difficult to, you know, raise a family and have a steady job or whatever if you're in, if you're gigging around all the time, you know, and on top of that, you know, it, especially when you're making, um, making theater, you're making TV, or whatever drama. It requires a level of openness and trust with your coworkers. That's just really unusual. Like you know, in a normal workplace, it's like you know, leave your problems at at home. But you know, if you're doing Macbeth, which you're not allowed to say, you know, some people don't like that. So sorry. But if you're doing Macbeth, and you know, there's a scene in the middle of the play where the hero of the of the show, Macbeth, Macduff, excuse me, um, learns that his wife and children have been slaughtered by. Uh, 
Macbeth. And so you have to, as the actor, deliver yourself to that experience. Like, what is that like? You know, what is what does that mean to me? And you have to do it night after night after night. And you need a level of, of there's a lot of paradoxes in acting. You need a level of confidence in your, and, and security within your emotional self um, to be vulnerable like that. But you also have to have a, a little bit of awareness where, you know, you have to, it has to be controlled. And, you know, the, the conservative aspects of putting on a show, you know, the schedules and deadlines and setting parameters within which you're rehearsing um, or delayed, you know, the idea of showing up and disciplining yourself every day yeah. um, to reach a certain goal, which is putting on the show. You know, like I had a, di I had a director who once said that the only reason that we have opening nights is because otherwise we'd just be rehearsing the whole damn time. You know, we, we, there, we need a deadline, you know, so we can get the work done. Um, but in terms of just like their, the constitutional makeup of the people, you know, that's why I don't think that there's going to be like a huge, you know, surging conservative arts movement because I just, not, I think there are great conservative artists or people who might vote conservatively. They might be socially conservative about certain things, but in general, um, they're just not built like that for me i would say like my ideal situation would be give me like a more conservative minded person who loves the arts to like run the company yeah and help to be raise like, money to be like your medici right. you know what i mean just yeah. like you know like like do all the all the icky bordery paperwork and like the business stuff mm -hmm. and just leave the kids to go and play and you know and and keep us in line do you, yeah. do you think it's gotten worse, by the way? I'm not just talking about theater, but in terms of Hollywood in general. I know that a lot of the uh, uh, Q boomers or what have you not have the uh, you know very active uh, imagination and theories about what exactly is going on in Hollywood. You know, Tom Hanks eating kids and all you know crazy stuff like that. When I look at a lot of these people, I just see them as being overly influenced by whatever the cultural milieu is. And I'm sure that some people, you know, get up onto some uh, some uh, crazy stuff behind closed doors. But to say that it's like this whole organized industry where you have to sell your soul to the devil in order to uh, progress upwards, like, I don't know, like you've met uh, people who were not just in Broadway, obviously, but people who are in Hollywood. What would your sense be of what's going on in the deepest, most secretive levels of that industry? Um, I mean, it's tough to say, you know, there's when you have people who, again, we were just talking about sort of liberal nature and open and the weird thing about the entertainment industry is that, you know, it's just like all the weird theater kids that, that you see, they end up becoming the next, you know, generation of producers and directors and writers and actors and everything. And that kind of weirdness never really goes away. And so you're dealing with people who, again, are super open, super emotional, kind of damaged and broken. Um, and then when you add a lot of publicity and money into the mix um, and all the perks of being famous and successful, which is people telling you that you're, you're gorgeous and that you're talented and everything you do is amazing. I mean, it's one of the reasons Dave Chappelle left to go to Africa. He like, just was like... You know, because you, you get to a point, and I got to this point where I was like, I just don't believe you. Like, you're saying everything I'm doing is great. I just don't, I just don't believe you. And it, maybe it was a reflection of my own low self-esteem, but it's like, who, who is telling the truth? And when my career began to take off, you know, I realized that, you know, yeah, I just, I'm booking these big jobs and working with these people, but I'm still me. You know, I still have to do the job. But for people from the outside were coming to me and saying, oh man, you a star, bro. It's like, you blowing up, man. Like, what's going on? Like, and I'm like, dude, I'm renting out a room in Astoria right now. And I'm just like living, you know, living my life. But it, it's tough because, I mean, you have to think about it from the person who, if you're an actor and you've been broke your whole life yeah. and everyone, you know, is, is crapping all over you because, you know, well, you're an actor, it doesn't really mean anything. And then you make it, right? And yeah your face is everywhere and people are telling you that you're amazing and you get into all the best clubs and restaurants and everything and you know you're treated like a, a god essentially um and dr drew is really great about this you know he, he's an expert in this kind of stuff you're still at fundamentally dealing with this damaged child but now they have all this stuff on them so in terms of like social mores and you know things are just looser and that's part of the nature of the job um 
I mean, but I've never seen, you know, these weird cabals of, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to find great euphemisms for the, to be friendly yeah. to the algorithm, you know, then, and, and there are people, you know, the sort of casting couch thing does happen. People, you know, are, and it's not just women, it's like, you know, guys as well who do that, who indulge in that kind of stuff. But, you know, then there's other people like Denzel Washington. I mean, you never hear any dirt about yeah. him. Um, you know, I never hear anything about Matt Damon. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are people who manage to get through it and keep their noses clean. But what I notice is that those are the people that tend to have lives outside the industry. They have families. Yeah. And I mean, I think Denzel, like, you know, coaches um, high school football or something. And he's that, very that's much, the anchor right there that keeps you grounded. Yeah. So and, th- and that's that's the big thing, you know, because if if your entire life is the industry, I mean, Felicia Rashad said this, you know, you have to have a separate life. You have yeah. to have something else. You know what I mean? And. Like acting is a job. It's a great job, and it takes all of you when you're doing it at the highest level. But it can make you crazy. <laughs> and the craft itself, the industry is so ridiculous, and the people in it are so ridiculous. And part of the, you know, I have some sympathy because there's a hierarchy of abuse at a certain point, especially if you're working like in in TV where there's so much money, you know, and you know, literally every second, you know, on a on a procedural or episodic is costing like, you know, thousands of dollars. Um, and things have to get done and you just see, you know, who, who the stars are and they can kind of do w- what they want and people cater to them and then, but the low, the sort of low level employees just get crapped on all the time, you know what I mean? But but the thing is, and Patrice O'Neill, we were talking about this before you, uh, we, we started recording, Patrice O'Neill made this great point, this great analogy. It's like, you know, with, with entertainment, Hollywood, all that stuff, it's just this big beast, and it chews people up, and then it just uh, uh, excretes them out. Um, but the thing about it is that when you're in the belly of the beast, you're making $2 million a week. Yeah. And so there's going to be an endless line of people who want to be in that belly and to be chewed up and just and shat out. Um, well, in the topic of uh, comedians, there was that recent uh, podcast interview with uh, Cat Williams. Oh, yeah. Where he was talking about this uh, humiliation ritual where black men are made to wear dresses. Well, here's the thing about that. Like... First of all, I mean, drag comedy has been a thing for thousands of years. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's not it's not a new thing. But I think what people don't understand about that aspect of black men in dresses is that black people, black Americans, generally speaking, have a have very very are very very protective machismo. Well, no, it's not. It's not. It's 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 more complicated than that. It's mm. not about machismo. It's about protecting the image of. The black man who's historically, mm. you know, has been emasculated and, and kept down these kinds of things. Um, there is also this aspect, which is really funny. I see black folks pushing back against like white progressives about, about like, like Mark Lamont Hill is just like you know well-known uh, left-wing black intellectual, and uh, he just tweeted out, uh, "Trans women are women," and there are all these replies from like these black guys who are like. Nah, bro, this ain't it. These white liberals putting all this stuff in your head, man. Like this, this ain't it, bro. Um, so you know the whole the whole black man in dresses thing. It's it's about it's. I think it's less about this aspect of machismo and more about like you know we need our we we want and desire our men to be men and manly and masculine because um, in the past that was that was seen as dangerous and crushed out of them. You know, the tall nails got Mm. chopped down. Is that also related uh, to uh, this uh, video that uh, Tariq Nasheed uh, did? Uh, What was it called? You you know what I'm talking about. I don't, but I know who Tariq Nasheed is. Yes, there was a video uh, where he was talking about how back in the uh, days of slavery, the uh, master used to, as a form of humiliation, punishment, he used to... Um, you know, have his way with the uh, with the male slave, and I don't know whether this was widespread, whether this is just something that happened in certain instances that Tariq Nasheed uh, decided to make a video about. Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I've never heard that. Um, I mean, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it did happen. Um, but you know, people like Nasheed. Oh, bug breaking. Are, that that's what it was bug called. Bug breaking. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard that term before. I mean, people like Nasheed are are sort of on the extreme <laughs> end of like you know the pro black spectrum. But, you know, I, I just think it's really more of an idea of protecting uh, black masculinity, which is really funny because, um, 
you know, that's exactly the opposite direction of where the entire like industry, entertainment industry is going. It's like yeah. everything that, that a man is, is bad. And let's break down the, the binary and everything. But meanwhile, you know, it, it, that's why it's so funny that you see uh, Democrats specifically, but like, you know, leftists, I guess, in general, who say like, we are the, the kings of black people. Like they, you know, we, we own yeah. them, basically. Do you think that the dress thing has something to do with uh, giving an F you to black masculinity in the weird, maybe like a subconscious way, some of those uh, comedy writers and producers. Uh, I don't think may, so. I mean, no, you know, because I, I mean, because then it just becomes more diabolical. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, look, like, look I don't at, think there's people yeah. sitting around in rooms smoking cigars. Like, yeah. ah, let's keep those darkies down and put it, put them in a dress. <laughs> I do think that it's mostly people who are like, I think this will be funny, and let's let's try that. And they don't have that kind of sensitivity that uh, that black americans do about you know these are our men and you're not going to you're not going to hurt our men anymore or mm. hurt the image of that's part of it that's part of it as well which you need to get into which is you know and it's and it's also kind of limiting as a black artist to be honest with you there's this idea that you know you're representing you know the entire uh, uh, race whenever you're on stage <laughs> or you're on screen which is an unfair burden um, and so there is an extra layer of you know we have to be portrayed in a certain light um, so that we are perceived in a certain way. And for me as an actor, I had, I had to let that go. There, I had to make the decision to say, I don't really care what, what the audience thinks of me, whether they're black or they're white or whatever, because it's, it's, it's putting me in a creative straitjacket, an interpretive straitjacket in terms of the choices I make as an actor. Like I was playing Caliban uh, in, the, in the Tempest, Shakespeare's The Tempest, who is a slave. I mean, he's referred to explicitly as a slave. He's, he's abused throughout the play. Um, and when I was cast as him, I was like, I knew that people were going to have their own baggage about it. And I mean, I, I literally had chains on my costume, for God's sakes. Um, but I was also the, like the person leading the charge. Like, you know, let's, let's go. Let's go there, man. Like, like, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go. And um, but the thing is, I totally abandoned the, this idea that I'm a black man playing a slave, and I'm about to be seen by all of Washington, D.C. on this stage playing a slave, man, I can't. It's like, no, man, read, read the text, and here's my point of view about this character, and uh, this is what I want to say about who this this character is. Yeah. And that made, that it, it humanized him, you know what I mean? Because yeah. when, you, cause when you saw me, like there's a scene where I'm kissing this man's boot. Um, you know, and we had these public school kids. You know, we had these these high school matinees, and um, the the kids from D.C. public schools, you know, mostly black kids, were like, "Oh hell no!" That, you know, so I just so I actually just doubled down. I just you know, kiss you know, because I didn't want to be swerved from yeah. from what I was doing. But I, you know, people are going to bring their baggage anyway. So the, the imagery of a black man kissing a white man's boot, especially in America, is going to make people feel a certain way. But so there is that level. But on a deeper level, it's. Why is this person? It's tragic because in the context of the scene, this character is debasing themselves because they have this mistaken notion that this person who's who they're uh, genuflecting towards is going to free them somehow from their captivity, and so there is a weird sort of um, on a human level outside of like identity politics. There's just the, the this tragedy of this mistaken, um, really kind of tragic character doing doing that, and I think people glom onto that more and they see the humanity more and when you're thinking just in terms of race and identity it's just the surface but if you're an artist and if you're especially if you're an actor you have to go deeper than that always and um, if you're only focused on the surface then the audience is not going to remember anything that you do and it's not going to matter and no one's going to care and you're, you're wasting their their time and and their money you're not giving them their money's worth but uh, yeah, there's a real issue that a lot of, I think, black artists, and Viola Davis has spoken about this as well, have to overcome this idea that, you know, we don't, it's not our job to be like, to portray us all in the best light. I mean, The Wire has all these characters that are like, you know, drug addicts and criminals, but it's a brilliant show because it yeah. never insults your intelligence and it gives these characters dimension. And that's what we're always looking for is dimension. Who is this person? If you're talking about a character who, is poorly written and they're just acting out and they're you know killing people or they're really promiscuous and there's no rhyme or reason to it then that's an issue with the writing um, 
but if it's but if it's a character doing that and you see you know their childhood trauma or yeah. you know they're they have some kind of addiction issue or they're mentally you know they they've got something else going on it's, it's like in from a story perspective then it's interesting then it's not racist it's just oh this is a human being going through something and suffering through something well uh, an- another example would be when it comes to uh half of my people the jews i think that a movie like once upon a time in america which was about the jewish mafia I think that that movie was really good for showing Jews as being bad guys while at the same time charismatic bad guys. And uh, that's the kind of mentality that I think works in favor of people not becoming racist or anti-Semitic or whatever when you actually get to show a lot of the flaws as well as things that would attract you uh, to that character. Unfortunately, a lot of the things that I think we're seeing today how uh, black people are portrayed uh, in a lot of the media is like this completely untouchable, saintly, perfect figure Dude, that you cannot criticize. Don't even, you know, like it, and it, and it's weird because when I got out of conservatory, this was 2009 when I got out, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad then. But over time, I just started noticing, and I think it's one of the reasons I, I never, I didn't take off at least when people thought that I would or as big as people presumed that I would because I was just turning down. I mean, I was lucky that I was auditioning a lot, but I was like, this, this character is ridiculous. Like, you know, I mean, I'm trained, I'm trained on the classics. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, check off and Shakespeare yeah. and all these, like these great writers who write with depth and dimension. And as an actor, I mean, back when I was 19, I was like, God, all the, all the parts I want to play are written for guys who are like 35 and up, you know, they've been through some stuff. I mean, even Tom Hanks at one point was like, I want to, I'm, I'm tired of playing, uh, these pansies. I want to play, you know, like a, a man, you want to yeah. play someone who has like some scars on their soul or something, someone just with some depth. And so, net, but I was reading all these scripts and it was either you're a mouthpiece for some progressive nonsense or the character is, is perfect and boring, you know what I mean? And And you can see the writers like not wanting to you know, have any flaws about this person and the other characters are affirming, you know, like you're awesome and everything. I'm like, dude, this is not, this is completely unrelatable. And it's, and as an actor, it's just boring. It's it's and like Nick Jr. It's like for infants. Is it what, Nick Jr.? Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's like a lot of the stuff today, it's also made with these candy colors, and it does feel like, whether it's intentional or not, people end up getting into this perpetual adolescence where they identify certain characters as only being good and the other characters as being bad. And, you know, not to say that there is no good or bad, there definitely are cases of people who are, you know, pure evil and that should be displayed. But it's definitely, it definitely looks like a programming mechanism where from a very early age, you can steer a lot of younger people into having these very sacred views on who they see as the good guy and who they see as the bad guy. And as a result, they're going to make a lot of stupid decisions. Like, for example, if we are talking about a lot of the criticisms that, uh, you know, to bring up uh, Thomas Sowell, who we're going to be talking about uh, later as well, he talks about a lot of the tragedy that has occurred in the black community, you know, with single uh, motherhood and uh, things of that nature. And unfortunately, it has resulted in um, a lot of uh, crime in areas like New York, Chicago, so on and so forth. So if you are somebody who's a uh, liberal guy and who doesn't want to make a bad impression, you would probably go out of your way to get rid of certain instincts that when you see like a young black dude who's probably high on something, who's like kicking uh, something on the street, the instinct would be, you know what, like, this dude, something may be wrong, let me, like, cross the street or walk the other way. Instead, you had that uh, a couple of months ago, this uh, uh, tragic... Yeah, 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 the tragic event there, where this Brooklyn activist was stabbed by this young black dude. And by absolutely uh, no means does it mean, like, oh, if I see somebody who is black, I'm going to turn to get... No, but it's like you have to have certain things in your mind as far as, you know, little telltale signs, like, yeah, like how people are dressed, how people walk, how people behave... A lot of that stuff does go into people's heads and they uh, figure out, like, is this somebody who I can trust not to knock me out? And I hope that we're going to live in a world where that's not going to be the case. But right now, unfortunately, it is. Well, I mean, you know, you just have to exercise some sense about this kind of stuff. You know, like, 
if I see someone coming down the street and, you know, they're dressed a certain way, they got the pants sagging and, you know, they're doing, I'm like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to even engage. You know what I mean? Um, it's different if it's, you know, a bunch of guys in suits or oh, something, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Or casual wears, business casual or something. Yeah. Um, but I'd say the same thing if I saw like, you know, some, you know, skinheads or like biker dudes or whatever, I'd mm-hmm. be like, yeah, I don't know if I want to really cross this person's path. Um, I mean, going back, you know, in terms of a childish kind of worldview, um, I think when it comes to identity politics, you know, and, and entertainment, you're dealing with people who their worldview, a, a major pillar of their worldview is white people bad, everyone else good. And what I wanted to say before is that, you know, it's so simplistic and in a, in a way, in a way it's, I guess I'll say it's, it's racist in its own way or prejudicial. And so what you have now is all these quotas in place saying you have to have, you know, this number of people of this particular, you know, ethnic persuasion or whatever in your, but the problem with that is, you know, like, it's so stupid to say, you know, black and white are the same thing. Okay. Well, what's black? Are they, are they Nigerian? Are they Trinidadian? Are they, um, are they? They're people of color. Clifton, how well, can yeah, you not but, know this? But it's like, you know, it's like with the white people. Are they Swedish? Are they, are, are you, you know, are you German? Are you French? Is that, what's your, what's your, are you Irish? Like, what's your lineage? And then alongside that, and this is the work you do as an actor, mm-hmm. because you're like, okay, well, because if you start just saying this person is black, well, what does that mean? Did they grow up, you know, are they West Indian? If that's true, then they have, you know, what kind of food do they eat? What, you know, what kind of songs do they, or music do they, do they listen to growing up? You know, what kind of religion did they practice? You can't just plug people in, you know, and just say, there's a black person that we need that here. Because then, and what's happened is you have to have, you have to kind of sanitize and flatten the writing because you can't, you can't get too specific if you're just saying this, a person of any race can play this, you know, when you're aiming toward, um, diversity and in a way it just flattens everything out you have all, all these bland people now who have no other real um traits because all the all the specific cultural color is kind of drained out not a lot of people are going to obviously admit it out loud but i think that racism has grown much stronger in a lot of people i think especially a lot of younger people because if something becomes a sacred cow there's going to be the impulse to uh, <laughs> right. to roast that cow, you know, to yeah. start barbecuing that cow. And uh, I think especially recently with things like uh, Google's uh, Gemini AI, uh, where, uh, you know, for those who don't know, uh, right now you actually cannot, at least at this moment of the, uh, of the show, you are not able to generate new images because of the backlash, because every time you would uh, put in generate founding fathers or generate Vikings or something like that, they would give a very diverse selection, you know, regardless of what's going on. And I would say, for example, before we were talking about Macbeth, uh, the um, Coen brothers, I believe, did a movie with Denzel Washington, uh, Macbeth, and... Uh, that is Shakespeare and that is art. And when it comes to art, I don't think any of this stuff matters. Like whoever could play whoever, you know, men were playing women. It's more of like, again, like this Dionysian um, situation we're in. But then when it comes to certain things that are history, you know, like the history of people, you know, how certain people came about a certain way and who were their leaders and their culture, that is very important not to mess around with, not to go yeah. like full 1984 with. And that's the backlash that I think is happening right now when people see that history is being messed around with. I think yeah. they start to react, uh, unfortunately, not just to the woke examples that they see, but I think that they're going to be reacting negatively even to people like yourself at a certain yeah. point, like when it gets too much. Well, I've, I've talked about this several times. You know, again, everything that these people do always backfires. It just backfires. It cause, it, like it does the exact opposite of what they wanted to do. And I envy guys like, like Denzel or James Earl Jones, you know, uh, Wesley Snipes, Lawrence Fishburne, these kinds of people, because they came up in an era where they got to where they are because they're good. But now people are very aware that people are being cast in shows because they check the right boxes. And I think reflexively people are saying that person isn't there because they're compelling or charismatic or skilled in any way. You know, they're just there because the studio was forced to hire that person. Um, And it sucks because the people who actually are, who do have the goods now are kind of, you know, they, they just kind of get 
lost in this this sort of sea of diversity of of, of you know and it, it's it, it's again it's just it's disrespectful to the people who actually take the time to like you know put in the work and and hone their craft to be told then because sort of the idea underneath is that you know if it weren't for us uh, us benevolent you know white progressives um you, you you know you need us to give you a i call it a cultural handout <laughs> you need us to give you a cultural handout here's here's a job and it's weird because on one hand it's nice you know i mean i i'm, I'm i've definitely benefited from um people trying to make more diverse hires or whatever but that was more of an aspect of well that was annoying in some sense because like if you're doing a shakespeare play and they're like well we want to set much ado in the caribbean and okay so are you saying if i if i wasn't black i wouldn't get this job because you wanted to have this particular look on stage like why can't we just do the freaking play and you know and cast me in it you know there's a there's a great pool now of like trained actors who can handle these kinds of texts and you know it doesn't it doesn't matter in the story in, in terms of the story or the plot what race this character is so you know so back in the 70s there was a production of king lear with james earl jones and and you know raul julia is playing edmund the villain and you know no one said anything you know what i mean and it was just it, it was what it was but it's a whole different thing to have these quotas enforced on people saying like you you must hire these people because then the focus becomes on hiring the right colors of people as opposed to like the right talent you know what i mean but do you think that even if we didn't have this uh this very leftist attitude uh, towards race there would still be in the back of people's minds that idea of like oh it would be nice to have like this person or that person i mean well like even in the industry that we could say like we're in like the podcasting uh, industry there is something that i think conservatives do like about having you know uh like br uh, bright uh, uh black people who uh say things that they agree with you know like they want more people like that even though they talk about oh like we don't care about race but it's like no like that does that does help i mean you know, one of the things that I never wanted to do, because I think a lot of black people are used as pawns by by the left for their political uh, means, political ends. I see a similar thing among conservatives. And one of the things I said, I never want to be used, you know, as a pawn. And I think a lot of conservatives or maybe right leaning people, whatever that even means anymore, um, are so paranoid about being perceived as racist that as soon as a black person comes along and, you know, says anything that they that makes sense to them they're like see we like him that's us he's part of us see we're not we're not racist because we like this guy and a it's cringe yes <laughs> but it's also just like you know it's, it's like the, the so, base so black exhausting. man it's you know just, like the uh and, you know i mean it's just it's dumb and, but the thing is you know black americans in my experience tend to be more socially conservative generally speaking mm -hmm. like on race stuff yeah, I mean they like the 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 left and leftist uh, uh, narrative has totally like been pumped into their brains for for decades, and there's reasons for that. It's very yeah. complicated. Um, but if you talk about you know abortion, you talk about yeah, religion, yeah. talk about the whole gender um, identity, um, these kinds of things, I mean you'll find much more often that black people will, be, will just be like, no, a boy's a boy, a girl's a girl. Like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? And I mean, Dave Chappelle in his uh, comedy special, Sticks and Stones, I mean, I was actually quite surprised where he talked about his views on abortion. And I mean, I'm in Atlanta now, and, you know, just a lot of black people, just, they aren't cool with abortion. They have more yeah. conservative views about abortion. And, you know, I was talking with my brother and uh, some of his friends about it, and, you know, like, they talk about how they have friends, female friends who've had abortions, and now they, they regret it, and they still think about it. Um, you know, so it's just funny to see the 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 Democrats going in one direction on this on this on these issues. But like black folks, even like on the ground, you know, you talk about the breakdown of the black family. People know this stuff like on the ground. Like if you talk yeah. to them one on one, they understand, you know, it's like, you know, the breakdowns of the families, the fathers, the fathers aren't there. We need more male, you know, male role models. Um, but then you have this massive progressive movement, which is like men are superfluous, men are bad. Um, it's one of the reasons I didn't, back in 2014, I went to the BLM website, um, their organization. And it's like when atheists, uh, when people read the Bible and they, they become atheists, I, I, like I read their website and I was like, no, nah, this organization is, is, is BS, man. And like there's one section where 
um, they talk about, uh, you know, parents and mothers and caregivers, yada, yada, yada. They, they deliberately skipped over fathers. And I was mm. like, these people do not care whatsoever about black America. Black Americans understand what's going on. But these ideologues, they, they don't. So, but yeah, it's just, it's just weird, you know, how the interplay of race on both sides of the issue, you know, on one hand, it's like, we own black people and we own the black, you know, experience. And the other side, it's like, please like us, please. No, yeah, like you, we want, we want you to be alongside us. See, we're, we're friendly, we're nice. Though, of course, the thing is, the further right you go, then you start seeing people who are, you know, they're overtly racist. Which I actually respect because then you know where they stand. You know what I mean? That they don't they don't hide it. You mm. know, around blacks, never relax. All these kinds yes. of things. But at a certain level, it also gets to uh, there was this American neo Nazi leader named George Lincoln Rockwell. He attended uh, meetings alongside black supremacist groups, where their idea was that you know we're going to be on our side and they're going to be on their side, and we will be friendly towards each other and agree to live in separate communities. Mm. Do you think that there is a tendency among uh, some uh, black people who you've spoken with of wanting to have, especially like now, even in colleges, they're talking about segregation and they have like these black only uh, places. Do you think that in a way that's coming back where there's this tendency, not so much like in the arts, obviously, but more as far as like communities, you know, like you do have like black only churches, not specifically, you know, as a law, but, you know, there tends to be like a lot of black people in black churches, a lot of, let's say, Chinese people in Chinese churches. So there is a kind of self-segregation uh, that ends up happening. Do you think that we're going to be seeing a lot more of that as racial tensions get higher? Um... I mean, I think on a certain level, humans are tribalistic anyway. I mean, as you pointed out, you know, you see Asians going with, you know, Jews going with Jews and everything. There's, there's, a, very, there's a very strong in-group bias um, among minorities. I know for myself, like I think about um, there's this uh, car service in Washington, D.C., and it's black owned. And, mm. you know, but it's, it's also one of those things where you know the cars are always immaculate and the drivers mm. are always perfectly dressed and they're just really personable and when you're scheduling calls you know the guy is super super uh, just really personable and just really professional and i'm just like you know a i love the service but it's also because they're black i'm like i won't give them all my money all the time you know i just yeah. like, i want to like you know help help them out yeah. i don't see the majority kind of separating i mean there's too much like intermarriage people have been for generations now that working together going to school together yeah um that said i don't know if that will be the case everywhere it just seems like in the more sort of left-leaning and progressive enclaves that's where it's really beginning to separate that's why it's so bizarre because you know i'm someone who's on the cusp i'm like i'm young gen x old millennial like i'm right on that 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 line so I feel like I grew up sort of in the afterglow. I was like, oh, okay, of the all, all the you know civil rights struggles and everything, and you know, not it wasn't perfect, enough, but society society can't be perfect. People aren't perfect, and it was it was pretty awesome up until around 2010, and then it just it's like now we're it's like we're we're more um, we seem more divided by race than ever. It's so weird to to to, to feel as though you've been benefited by the sacrifices made by people who came before you, but then to see this, this young crop of like activists and intelligentsia, all these other people, um, hurtling us back into like in, into segregation. It's very, very bizarre. And there's not that many of them too. That's the thing, like it's a loud minority. But, but the thing is, and I was talking to um, friends about this, and I probably should be more vocal about this as well. It's just that, and part of the problem that I think people who are not like leftist or whatever are facing in terms of the culture war is that you have this small cluster of people who go into education, they go into academia, they become celebrities, they, you know, they're writers, they're tastemakers, they're journalists or whatever. Um, they become tech gurus. It's a small cluster of people, but this small cluster of people, I mean, they have millions and millions of, of followers, like, you know, a piece. So yeah. their views, you know, or, or they're teaching the, the young, impressionable minds of the next generation so they have all of these um they have all this influence and sway um over a majority of the population which does not think that way and so it 
and going back to entertainment, I think part of the issue, especially like in New York, you know, you're on this magical island of Manhattan where, you know, you can get everything you want within a 10 block radius yeah. at any time of day, you know. Um, you kind of, I think, become seduced into this idea that this is how life is, this is how everywhere should be, um, this is how everyone thinks, and it's just not like that. And I think because of all of these uh, voices who have this disproportionate um, outsized influence because of the sectors they control, it seems like they're in the majority, but you know, but then you talk to people and it's like, no, nah, it's, not, it's not really like that. It's not really like that at all. The only problem is that people also have the uh, bystander effect where even though a lot of people wouldn't hurt a fly normally, when you get to a certain point and you can look at various societies that exist in the earth today where most people don't want to go out and harm people, but harm is happening all the time again, like whether it's by certain police, uh, certain um, uh, terroristic groups, whatever, most people who are within that environment, they go along to get along, and they're not really going to resist. They're not going to resist when, let's say, a gay person gets thrown off a rooftop, for instance, somewhere in the Middle East. They're just going to, you know, probably form a crowd and observe what's going on in silence. You know, some of them may think that's good, some of them may disapprove, but, you know, they cannot say a single thing lest they also be punished. So when it comes to the racial dynamics going forward, a big fear that some people have who um, talk with people who live in South Africa right now is that if we go through the process of, let's say, a lot of the black community being hijacked by these uh, racial ideologues, then they would be able to use that community to gain power and to gain influence in such a way that they're going to be offering things to that community and they're going to get that community to commit uh, horrible things against, you know, whatever system they're fighting against. And as a result, like what happens in South Africa right now is that you have this uh, leftist communist party who openly talks about, uh, you know, killing the, uh, the boar, you know, the white farmer and all that. And a lot of the people here in the West make an excuse of saying, like, oh, that's just like a cultural thing, you know, pay that <laughs> no mind. But these farm killings uh, do occur, and n not just against white people, against, you know, black farmers as well. But there is still, like, this great racial animosity. I mean, definitely, you know, there's been a a apartheid and a lot of these terrible things. But the fact that you have this mission stated, you know, by the communists of uh, doing these horrible things and most people just kind of, end up going along with it or excusing it. I don't want that situation to happen here in the country. And what do you think, if God forbid we end up going that direction, what do you think is going to turn it back in such a way as to minimize the amount of casualties and the amount of bloodshed? Jeez. Well, hypothetically speaking, if it got that bad, um, I mean, the fact of the matter is there's, there's just not that many of us compared to everybody else. Um, I'm not... I'm not convinced that, you know, for instance, the Asian or Latino communities will be jumping up to our defense, um, mm. you know, if, if these kinds of things happened. Um, you know, I'm not convinced. I mean, even, it's funny you mentioned South Africa. I mean, even black Africans, you know, I don't know if people know this, but they don't really have much respect for black Americans. Um, and. You know, so the, if you're talking about maybe allyship, I, I don't even know if they, if this sect of militant Black Americans would even have a big, a lot of support. It's well, just... unless we're talking about the cities, though. So to be clear, for example, in Manhattan and in other cities, like during the uh, 2020 Summer of Love, there were a lot of you know lootings and things like well, that that happened. Like before, because yeah. before I was getting into like depending on where you are mm. and. You know, and my immediate reflex is to say that the more sort of left wing and progressive a, a an area is, the more likely there's going to be. I mean, I mean, talking about South Africa, literally communists, right? Yeah. Um, that to me, that's a far more likely scenario. I just, you know, I but I don't know if. Like, would all the Nigerians and, uh, you know, other people from uh, Africa who would look down at the, you know, the unfortunate uh, situation of uh, black Americans uh, just have their own kind of like white flight 
into the suburbs, you know, along with the Asians and with everybody else and just kind of like leave the cities to, let's say, the um, unfortunate like black American score in that situation, as well as some of the uh, migrants that are coming in from like uh, Venezuela and Central America who do have uh, connections with the uh, drug cartels, unfortunately. So like those seem to be like the uh, two elements right now that people are worried about the most when it comes to urban environments. So if that happens, if there is like this exodus of people who just, you know, don't want to mess with it, don't want to try to save the city, where do we go from here? Does that mean that the cities are just going to become like these very violent places and eventually it's going to be like some reconquista, you know, like a couple of uh, you know decades later? Or like, I don't know, like I know we don't have a crystal ball, but if there was like a horrible situation like that, how do you think we can come out of it through the other side? Wow. Um, my my honest reflex is to say that, you know, let the garbage take care of itself. And I think that people have a self-preservation instinct. Um, they'll see the danger and they'll be like, "No, I don't want. I don't want any part of that. Just let it, let it all burn down. We're going to live our lives over here." I mean, I used to date a Nigerian woman, and you know, I I began to hear the same kinds of things about her parents and and the sort of Nigerian <laughs> diaspora, I guess. Yeah, I began to hear some of the same stereotypes about their parents as you'd hear about Asian parents. Mm. You know, in terms of just being more traditional and you know, the tiger hard work mom, and you know what I mean, or yeah. just you know, keeping the family together, religion, these kinds mm -hmm. of things. And I mean, even in the acting industry, like a lot of the top actors, Uzo Aduba, Idris Elba, Chiwetel Ejiofor, um, David Oyelowo. I mean, they're they're all Nigerian. You know, it's really yeah. interesting. So there, I mean, there's a reason for that. You know. Um, so I guess I say all of that to say that I think the sensible people, no matter who they are or what their background is, are going to are going to see the trouble brewing and they're going to be like, I want to live. I want to make sure that my kids are safe and, and have a great education. I'm going to get the hell out of here anyway. And frankly, we already do it. I mean, Chris Rock um, had this classic bit in 1995 about the Civil War in the black community. And he said on one side is black people. On the other side is mm Mm -hmm. And he's like, mm's are messing things up for everybody else. Like black people are cool. They they you know they go to they go to work and they do their thing and they you know have a good time or whatever. But this group of people just messes it up for everybody. You can't go anywhere because of because of them. So there's already a level of separation I think among people. And it's funny they call it white flight because it's like you know no one is accusing the the Obamas of white flight when they you know buy uh, beachfront property in Martha's Vineyard. Um, so, I mean, I think people, partly for the reasons you mentioned before, you know, they they, they don't want any parts of that and, you know, they, they would rather go along to get along, but not to the point where they have to suffer, you know, intense violence. I... <sighs> On the other side, though, do you think there's going to be a recognition among, uh, let's say, white people if people end up getting even more radicalized that, hey, there's actually a difference between, you know, this gentleman from Nigeria or, uh, you know, Clifton Duncan, you know, and the people who you're having troubles with. Because again, like my concern is that more most people are not nuanced. Most people are just going to go for, you know, skin color equals good or skin color equals bad. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe I have, it's weird for me to say this, maybe I have a bit more of an optimistic view. I, I, I because there are definitely people who, excuse me, who look at skin color. That's like the ultimate metric. But in my experience, you know, in two hemispheres and traveling around the country, and uh, you know, most people they try to be good. They like they they want to go along to get along, and you know, they may have personal disagreements or or maybe some animus or whatever, but. In my observation, most people just are like trying to live their lives in the best way that they can. And if they run, if they happen to run into like, you know, rogue elements or like bad people, then they try to find a way to distance themselves from those people. They have, they have an understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Um, it's tough. It's tough to say because I'm also thinking in my head, I'm thinking about in these left wing circles. And it's really funny, I make fun of white progressives because they're, you know, they, they bend over backwards trying to um, make themselves seem more appealing. But behind closed doors, these same black people, you know, just will talk all kinds of 
t- they say all kinds of terrible things about white people, you know what I mean? So yeah. um, maybe it's part of a tribalism. Maybe I'm naive and too optimistic. I just, um, I don't, I don't think it'll get as bad as South Africa. <laughs> um, but like you mentioned the term radi- radicalized. Like, what do you mean by radicalized? By radicalized, I mean the young kids who are on TikTok right now who are watching either people who are very leftist or people who are more on the right, like let's say Andrew Tate. And that does bring up a question that I've been very curious about. When you look back in history in the early 20th century, you get some of the most brilliant people, you know, like Arthur Miller, Ernest Hemingway. You know, Ernest Hemingway was a Stalinist agent. You get people who have devoted their entire lives to this horrible system of the USSR because they don't know any better when it comes to economics and they don't really know what's going on in there, yet they happen to be extremely brilliant, extremely charismatic, and they were the ones who were influencing the intelligentsia during uh, the early 20th century. Like, there was this amazing book that I highly recommend everybody to read. It's called The Red Decade by Eugene Lyons. And Eugene Lyons, originally, he was a uh, socialist, uh, but then later on, when he actually saw what was going on in Stalinist Russia, he quickly reversed the way that he views things, and he was warning people about the fact that most of the intelligentsia in the United States during the 1930s and 40s were not just communists, they were Stalinists, and they considered other socialists, like non-Stalinists, to be what they termed social fascists. And they were extremely exclusionary when it came to anybody who said something bad about the Soviet Union or mentioned gulags. Or things. Like, they just wouldn't believe them. They would kick them out. The reason why I'm saying all this is today we have these leftists who, compared to the brilliant people I mentioned, are just completely brain-dead. But we also have people who watch TikTok. And my question to you is, is it better to have people who are not as brilliant, who are guiding the conversation, or not? That's a, that's a tough one. Um... Yeah, you know, there's there's the digital world where we see all that stuff. I mean, this is why I urge people all the time, like stop watching the news and get off of social media and actually talk to people. Um, I guess my hope in that regard is that if people are becoming radicalized on TikTok, um, the hope is that when they meet reality, then... But even me saying that, I'm just like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. I, like I don't, what I don't reality? Know, you know, well, I just, I can't because, you know, and I was having this conversation about people are like, you know, is, you know, will show business change? I'm like, dude, they're, they're enslaved by this ideology. Like that has like a body count of, in the tens of millions. Like they, they didn't stop. Yeah. So if their shows are losing money, like they're not going to stop there. You know, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But, but even among but, politicians though, like we've had people like uh, uh, Benito Mussolini, and he was incredibly intelligent. Yeah. Like yeah. compared to anybody who you can mention today, you know, AOC would be like oh a toddler God. compared no. to Mussolini or any you know what I mean? Like these were just like these were like a different breed of people when it came to their their intelligence level. But I'm thinking like today if we have people like let's say Nick Fuentes or Andrew Tate on the right or AOC and you know whoever else like I don't know, Hassan Piker on the left yeah. These are complete dunces. Yeah. But does that make them more effective or less effective in steering the masses into doing certain things as opposed to the brilliant people who are able to capture, you know, the hearts and minds of the intelligentsia? And I consider today's intelligentsia to be pretty crappy, but who were able to capture the hearts of minds of the intelligentsia back then in such a way as to actually enact public policy. I mean, look at FDR. A lot of his cabinet were uh, Soviet sympathizers, if not outright spies. So, like, there's a lot of power in having brilliant people guide the conversation. But would you say we're smarter today 
or stupider today are pretty much the same when it comes to things like, you know, most people back in the 20s, 30s, they were rural people, you know, like they may have, you know, read a book here and there, but they didn't have access to all this information. Like they may have known certain things about the changing of the seasons, how to plant certain crops, when, but they were also people you would describe as the proletariat, you know, the masses, the workers. And when it comes to those people, they were able to be guided by people like Mussolini, like Hitler, like uh, Stalin, like Lenin, uh, into adopting certain views, even if they didn't have TikTok. Today, we have an overabundance of information. Do you think that people today are just the same, or are they stupider, or are they smarter? And how do you think that these new ideologues are going to affect reality when it comes to the people who they have at their disposal? Well, I mean, I think that human beings um, have remained largely un largely unchanged over time, um, which is both good and bad. Um, you know, I do think that the education system was way, way better. Like, I feel like for me personally, I missed the breakdown of public education by like literally by one year, like before they implemented standardized testing, like my... In, I was like in the eleventh grade, and then like the next grade, the next year they began to implement it. Um, so the education is, you know, it's just not as good. And you know, you can see all these videos of like uh, Generation Z um, teachers and everything just being like, "What is wrong with with Gen Alpha?" And yeah. other, you know, and and you see millennials saying, "What is wrong with Gen Z?" Like, what the, what like what the hell is going on? Is it like old man yells at cloud? I don't I don't think so because. I think people are saying, well, this is what I was like when I was a kid. And they're looking at the landscape, just like you were saying, like now there's all this technology and that's being pumped in, you know, all these things that are being pumped into these kids' brains. And I mean, Jonathan Haidt writes about sort of helicopter parenting and like how people have been coddled. So there's there's been these cultural shifts in terms of how we discipline people, um, how we structure education, um, which have... I think had a lot of negative impacts. I think now it's weird because we're in the age of information, but we're the dumbest that we've 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 been potentially. But you can learn so much stuff. I mean, I've got you know hundreds of books on my e-reader that I can just download. Yeah. You know, and and it's it's an amazing thing. But the the problem is getting people to become um, interested in learning. You know what I mean? It's it's so much easier to watch a bunch of TikTok videos than it is to to actually dive into <laughs> Dostoevsky or, you mm. know, Aeschylus or something. But does it remain equal as far as the people back then? You know, maybe there was like a nice kind of uh, middle way where you had people who had access to information and used it responsibly. But it seems like back then, what information did the masses have? I mean, in the Middle Ages, they had a preacher who spoke in Latin. They didn't even understand what the guy was talking about most of the time. And otherwise, they just knew things about how to survive given their environment. And they didn't even invent certain things that the British ended up inventing, which made uh, you know farming uh, much uh, much easier. So it wasn't like they were brilliant farmers either. You know, like these were not people who, from what I understand, were that uh, were that bright. So would you say that that quality of having a responsible a responsible way of using information? and being curious enough to get that information in the first place is almost like a Buddhist sand painting. You know, like it takes time to construct it and then like a single blow and it's out of here and you gotta start all over. Like, or do you consider it to be something that we can like grow upon and grow upon and actually maintain for a long time? I mean, it's tough, you know? I mean, I'm thinking, the first thing I think of when I think like back in the day you know, there was not all this technology, you know, like there was the radio and, you know, newspapers yeah. and TV eventually and these kinds of things, um, telephones. But you, there was still a required connection to life and like the visceral aspect of life and living life, talking to people, negotiating with people, coping with people that I think kind of kept you, it had to keep you grounded in a certain basis of reality. At the same time, I mean, I think about your examples of Hemingway. I mean, George Bernard Shaw, yeah. brilliant, brilliant dude, but total, like a Hitler, like he was pro-Hitler, you know what I mean? And a, a, and a socialist. It also asks, you know, begs the question as well, you know, why is it that so many artists become useful idiots for, you know, these, um, 
for these regimes. I just, you know, I, Lev, I just don't know the answer to your question. Um, I, what I want to say is I think it's wonderful that we have all this technology, that we have all this access to information. And you can look at, you would, you, and you would hope, you would hope that someone who watches Hassan Piker or the Young Turks um, might, you know, be able to avail themselves, you know, of maybe some Hayek or something. <laughs> maybe because it's out there and available. But, I, you know, I just... That's very I, optimistic. That's super optimistic. I mean, I do think there's, there seems to be a building movement though of people really trying to crack down i mean i know new york is new york is ridiculous but they're you know they're suing these tech companies i think yeah. people like john Hyde have the right idea like you know get phones out of schools mm. get these people off of screens what all comes to the parents because people like steve jobs uh, didn't let their uh, kids have uh, access to uh, ipads because they understand how powerful this technology is and eventually if we're talking about you know neuraling getting like the chips in people's brains like a whole other ball game yeah. but my final uh, question has to do like with the algorithm but specifically with the situation that somebody like yourself is in because i know in the beginning of this uh, conversation you said that you know you're going to be focusing on art and not on politics i don't think you can help it because you're a very brilliant person you're very curious and you like to think about everything like in the conversation that we've been having right now even though we've touched upon art we also touched upon politics we touched upon culture and the industry that both of us are in is one that unfortunately given the nature of it if there's some event that happens it is very beneficial for us to talk about that event because people who are searching for that event on the internet will end up discovering us through uh, searching for it and the big problem that I have with people who are on more of like the anti-woke, reactionary, whatever you want to call it side, is that it's like an all-in type of deal. Specifically, like uh, you say, I'm wearing the uh, Ukraine shirt over here. So I am somebody who is uh, extremely pro-Ukraine. And I also understand that there are so many people because Biden is not for Ukraine, they're going to be against Ukraine. And it doesn't even matter if you happen to come across something that is contrary to what you believe on that subject. I just noticed that most people who are against the leftist elements that are going on right now, they have adopted full stop all the talking points, some of which are correct, and some of which, in my opinion, are completely wrong. Like the fact that, no, we should do like an America First style pre-World War II isolationism, you know, while Russia's going into Ukraine, never mind what's going to happen if Russia keeps going, you know, after Ukraine and starts going to the Baltics and Poland, so on and so forth. It's completely out of their mind. And the reason why I bring it up is how much do you think for yourself and from the people you've spoken with is that very important to make sure that you're following the algorithm because otherwise there is a fear that you're not going to make as much money. Because if you start talking about Ukraine in a different light, all of a sudden people are going to start unsubscribing. It's like, hey, why is this guy saying something I disagree with? You know, even if I agree with like 90% of what he's saying, you know, no, this is like, I disagree with this, I'm going to unsubscribe. Because I really think like a lot of people who are in that industry have that mentality. Like, no, I better... I better stick to these talking points or else I'm going to lose money. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's very difficult, you know, and I mean, I find myself in, in a similar position sometimes because if you build a, a decent sized following, um, you know, people kind of get used to you in, in, one, in one arena. I mean, I, I was commenting a lot on, um, on the uh, public health emergency stuff yeah. and, and I tend to criticize uh, the Democrats a lot. Um, and it's funny because I get coded. People are like, oh, well, obviously you're a Republican. I'm like, dude, I don't. I really don't care about the GOP. Like, I don't pay any attention to them. I think they're kind of nuts, and they're just reacting to whatever the Dems are doing, and it's annoying. But I think one of the reasons for the shift in my perspective. I mean, I think for for an artist, it's useful to like the, M Michael Chekhov, the nephew mm -hmm. of the great playwright Anton Chekhov. He talks about how the actor, you know, needs to have his fingers on the pulse of society. But at the same time, um, I think if you're looking at things through a strictly political lens or the lens of current events, I think a lot of time you're trying to be first, you're trying to be kind of out there, you're trying to get and you and you're 
employing whatever techniques to you know grab attention and you know and headlines and these kinds of things um i think oftentimes that can strip these stories of of nuance and i mean i bring up Chekhov again one of the things i love about his writing is that he he was the first author i'd worked on playwright that i worked on where you could just allow your you can allow your performance to be as complex as you yourself you know what i mean because yeah. he understood people so well that you can just play all the chords you know within your of your instrument and, and it could still be true because he's writing complicated people so these issues are often complicated i mean the whole ukraine thing you know and i've you know i don't know that much about it but you know, but as soon as I see people saying this is this side is all good, this side is all evil, I'm like, I don't believe either of you because um, these stories are always complicated because human beings are complicated. Life is complicated. There's, you know, it, it's and it's difficult because you and I've, I've found this as well, where, you know, it, it doesn't matter how nuanced you try to be, you know what I mean? Uh people are always going to find a reason to argue with you and, mm. be, and be mad about it. But that could also be a way to deflect from the issue too, where at a certain point somebody could say, well, this is too complicated to get into. I'm just not going to bother. But then if that's the attitude, if you are in some position of influence, you are letting certain things be gotten away with, even though if you look at it and say like, sure, I'm not going to say like this side is like an angel, but at the end of the day, we still have to make some executive decision. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's, those are the hard decisions that people have to make in life where you can't just go about and say, you know, well, there's something wrong with this. Because that's the argument that I see from people like Tucker Carlson, for instance, where he talks about, well, you guys don't like Russia. Well, what about all these bad things that Ukraine did? But if we look at the bigger picture, what exactly is going on right now? Like, I know I keep harping about this and the people on the Break the Rules are already, you know, yeah, here we go. Left talking about Ukraine again, yada, yada, yada. But guys, you got to keep in mind, like, how important what's going on right now is. Because if, for example, you know, God forbid Ukraine loses, Russia gains Ukraine, let's say Trump becomes president, and let's say he's not going to be that much pro-Ukraine or pro-NATO, but he's going to maybe instill a little bit of fear in Putin from, you know, continuing onwards. Okay, fine, and Putin's going to have Ukraine, he's going to stock more weaponry and power from uh, China, build up the military, you know, keep on building it up just like the Germans were doing pre-World War II, and as soon as Trump leaves and we get some people who are a bunch of cowards in office, then <laughs> Putin's going to strike, he's going to go into Poland. I do not for a second believe that something like Article 5, which is the uh, NATO uh, defense pact, which uh, means that like all the NATO countries have to come to the defense of a NATO country that's being attacked. I don't think that's going to happen because I look at what happened in World War II. We had plenty of these various defense pacts going on in Europe, and that didn't amount to diddly squat when uh, the Germans came in. And I think that people on the right, even though they claim to know about history and they claim to be against, you know, this rabid leftism, they don't understand that what's going on right now is somebody like Putin is going to take as much as you allow him to take. Same thing with leftists. Leftists are going to take as much as you allow them to take until you stop, stop them. them. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's been my issue with a lot of conservatives with a lot of Republicans. They cannot apply that same mentality just because I think most of them have just been programmed to assume that whatever my opponent says is wrong but that's a losing strategy. They're just playing the Hegelian dialectic. Yeah, you know, I mean, again, I go back to this idea of, that's why I began to kind of move away from that stuff, because I saw people becoming deranged by it. Um, I mean, I think there's a difference between saying it's complicated as a way of, as you're saying, like, I don't want to get into it, um, versus saying it's complicated, here's why. And, you know, from Putin's perspective, this is what's going on. And there, here's a historical context in this yeah. as well. From the Ukrainian perspective, here's what's going on. And here's this historical context as well. Therefore, given all, given all these factors and variables, this is where I stand on this issue and why I think, like, that's a whole different ball game. And I think people would respect, I think a person who did that would, would garner more respect even from people that, that, that disagree with them on that issue because they, they've taken the time to step through the argument in a detailed way as opposed to just being like, well, I'm here and I'm here. Well, I'm here yeah. because you're here and I'm there because you're there. Um, or saying, yeah, I don't know, man. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it's too complicated, dude. Um, you know, I, 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 do, I do think that there is a, 
and maybe this is my naivete again, I mean, you know, but because there's like the sort of low IQ kind of content out there, which is so polarizing. Yeah. And uh, and being polarizing, I mean, it, it helps in a lot of ways. Like, not, like now that I understand it better, I see people doing it. And I'm like, you know, like there was some person who tweeted about, you know, Christians should never do yoga. Just don't do it. <laughs> I was like, part my my lizard my lizard brain was like, Ugh. but I was like, I know what you're doing, dude. I know what you're doing. Like, there, there's a part of you that that genuinely does like maybe thinks this, but you're saying it in the most like polarizing and divisive way possible to generate like engagement and whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, I respect people who are able to say this is why i i think this about this and like you know if you're talking about ukraine and i feel this because yada 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 and the possibilities in the future yeah. and, and therefore that you know what i mean like that's a whole different thing where i can say i can say oh yeah okay yeah i hadn't thought about that before or i hadn't seen it from that perspective before um but it takes a lot of time and focus and is there really is there really a huge market for that kind of depth and complexity and nuance? No. It's, just, it's so much easier. No. It's so much easier to just go on one side or the other. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's the issue we're facing. The only thing I could possibly think of doing is just like bringing a lot of girls here and uh, uh, just uh, having something like they have in uh, the whatever, whatever podcast, podcast. <laughs> but try to just like sneak in some, uh, you know, nuanced things in there for people to consider. But uh, honestly, I don't know. I think most people are just going to get the Neuralink and turn into robots, and then we're going to have another thing to contend with. But uh, until that happens, though, we do have the opportunity to try our best to at least reach a minority of people who are not stuck in that paradigm, and they're not going to take the mark of the beast. You know, They're not going to have the uh, implant that's going to control their minds. And that's what I'm doing with Break the Rules. The whole point of this whole thing is not to reach, you know, these uh, masses. I don't really care about the masses. I care about the people that are actually understanding what it is that we're talking about here and that can contribute money through patreon.com slash break the rules. Go there right now and we have exclusive episodes and uh, we're going to have Q&As with Jason Giorgiani, another wonderful people coming up uh, soon. And there is a Q&A with Jason Giorgiani you can watch there right now. And uh, yeah, the point is, is that when it comes to the way that we market ourselves, and this brings us to the uh, Thomas Sowell uh, project that you're doing right now, that is going to be a way that we can attract people who are actually like-minded, who are going to support our work. And we don't have to ever be in a position where we feel like we're forced to, you know, dance the tune of something that's going to attract, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of people. So in your project right now, you've already raised a lot of uh, money, right? Like you have, uh, uh, how many, how, how much support have you gotten already with Thomas Soul um, Play? Well, the last time I checked, because um, at this point I'm kind of freaking out whenever I check it, um, <laughs> but it was at 628 backers and uh, it was uh, over 70, $72,000 Wow! that we'd raised. How many days? Um, inside of two weeks we raised that. Um, Amazing. It's pretty remarkable and astounding. Um, I, I just, I'm looking at it like even I can't believe it. Because originally I was like, yeah, I just, you know, maybe I'll ask for like 10K and I just take some time off and um, just focus on writing this thing. But people just were so enthusiastic about it. And I think part of it is they're enthusiastic about me and, and you know, my story and the fact that, that I'm doing it. They're enthusiastic about soul himself obviously they yeah. find him to be a very fascinating and exciting figure and i think they're also they're also excited about supporting something that's done outside of you know the system as it were and for the people who were living under a rock can you just tell a little bit about who thomas Sowell is and why he appeals to you yeah well thomas Sowell, you know he was born during the dark days of jim crow and uh you know he's born in uh north carolina i want to say or georgia one of those two in the south somewhere and uh but grew up in harlem ended up going to um, Harvard well he was at Howard University first and mm. then he switched over to Harvard but what was most appealing about him to me is that he was a diehard Marxist for for a, a significant portion of his young life and even after studying with the renowned um, uh, economist uh, Milton Friedman he still was a Marxist after that but it wasn't until 
working for the Department of Labor, I believe, the government, where he was like, hold up, something is something is weird here. And I think it's a very relatable trajectory for a lot of people. It was for myself because, you know, I was like sort of a die, not die hard, but a default sort of brain dead liberal, you know, and then my mind changed. I think it's it's relatable because you see someone who's like, he, you know, he's trying to understand the world and why things are the way they are. And he talks about this, how the the, the Marxist worldview explained a lot of like why some people have so much and why so many have so little. And it, it, it gets you right in the heartstrings of like, you know, I can't believe this is this is so unjust and unfair. I have to do something about this. Um, but when confronted with reality, having the integrity and the humility um, and the intelligence to turn around and say, okay, this is not what I thought it was, and I'm going in a different direction now. And also his dedication to, um, you know, facts and evidence. Um, and I think another aspect about him which is fascinating is that he's able to break down these complex topics um, into very accessible and easy to understand language. And, you know, like he wrote Basic Economics, which I feel like should be uh, required reading for all high school students. You know, yeah. if, a, if a dumb actor like me can read it and understand it, you know, then everyone should be able to do so. Outside of his intelligence, his ability to change his mind, you know, I think he's appealing for a lot of people who've never been exposed to him because they've grown up in this world where, again, you know, all the media they consume, the shows they watch, the music they listen to, the, the news they watch, um, whatever algorithm they subscribe to, um, is feeding them one one worldview. It's feeding them one type of information and perspective. And you have this this black guy with this killer afro and these big horn rimmed glasses, just completely like back in the '70s, saying, "Oh, gender gender pay gap? No, this is that. Oh, racism discrimination? Well, yes, but." This and this and this, you know, and um, oh, really? Like, well, show me the evidence. Oh, compared to what? Oh, okay. Well, but do you have any data to back that up? You know what I mean? And I think people, it's it's unusual for people to see someone just so incisively just be like, no, this is wrong, and I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to tell you why in detail, and in a way that is sort of um, dryly funny, but also simple and straight yeah. to the point. You know. I mean, I love his interviews where he's asked a question and it's like, well, Tom, do you think that this um, policy from Barack Obama was helpful or hurtful? Do you think that it did? He's like, no. And that's his answer. He just gets like right. He just Cuts gets right the to the Gordian point. knot. He just gets right yeah. to the point. And so there's, there's these other one man shows about people like Paul Robeson and Thurgood Marshall and yeah. James Baldwin and... Um, and uh, Louis Armstrong, and I said, you know, why not make a show about Thomas Sowell? And, you know, I, I picked up his memoirs the other day and flipped up to flipped to a random page. And, I mean, he's talking about, he was kind of built different for, from, from the beginning. He, he, there's a little anecdote where a sociology professor of his came into the room, and I guess this was after, like, the Brown v. Board of Education ruling came down. And this sociology professor was like, oh, it's going to, this is really great. And apparently Sol just said, okay, well, but Plessy v. Ferguson or whatever this ruling was, was like 50 years ago, you know, do we really feel like things are going to change, you know, in terms of integration now? Like he was all, he, he just had this perspective for, for a long time that was just to the left, so to speak, um, figuratively, figuratively speaking, um, out of left field. You know, he was, just, he was just kind of built different. He was like a different kind of guy. Yeah. And um, countercultural in many ways, and especially as a black person, saying the things that he's saying, there's a, there's immense social pressure. You know that's why they they can look at someone like Clarence Thomas and completely just just destroy him. Mm. You know because he has the wrong political beliefs. And they had a recent uh, John Oliver, the British John Oliver, yeah, had that recent that, show yeah. where uh, he wanted to pay money to like millions of dollars to Clarence Thomas to quit the Supreme Court. I mean, you know, again, if we're being technical here, isn't that illegal to do? It's a bribe. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, to a Supreme Court justice. I mean, that that that's the other thing, by the way, like a lot of these late night show hosts. I mean, I'm not the first one to say it, but it seems like they mask a lot of these incredibly politically charged things 
with you know oh i'm just joking around i'm just being i'm just being a funny man i'm just being a comic and uh yeah and i think that that that's a way that they like whether we're talking about john stewart or stephen colbert or any of these people they were able to influence a lot of young people especially like my generation into viewing let's say conservatives in a certain lens and yeah. decisions yeah. like that just because a lot of them were very charming you know like especially john stewart i was gonna say john you know because I watched The Daily Show from the beginning when Craig Kilborn was hosting it, mm. and the show still worked. Um, uh, Trevor Noah is just not good and not funny in that role. But um, but John Stewart came on, and I didn't like the tone in the sense that because Craig Kilborn was so much more dry and just a, like a, a dry kind of news reporter anchor yeah. kind of presence, and John Stewart was more clownish and like more comedian. But I think the thing about John Stewart, which I appreciate, I mean, I think he's. I do think he's a smart person. I think Stephen Colbert is a smart person as well. Um, I mean, I still love the the White House Correspondents' Dinner in 2006, where he just he just completely skewers the Bush administration. <laughs> you know, and, and Bush is like a few feet away yeah. from him. Um, and of course, the the headlines the next day, like all the conservatives were like, you know, this isn't funny, and the libs were like, Colbert kill. But it was very partisan back then. But it was also a, a time where like Bill O'Reilly could come on to John Stewart's show, yeah. or Bill O'Reilly could go on to Dave Letterman's show, and or John Stewart could go on Chris Wallace's Fox show, or or on Bill O'Reilly's show, and they kind of had a, like a, a frenemy kind of thing going on. And it just seemed way more, it seemed a bit more cohesive, but I definitely fell into that trap of like, this is where I get my news from yeah. The Daily Show. But, I, but with John, I was sort of annoyed when he would say, well, I'm just a comedian, yada, 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 because clearly you're not, you know what I mean? Like, like, be honest about it. But at least with Jon Stewart, I had a level of respect for him in terms of like, well, like, he's he's not a dummy. He's partisan, but he's not he's not a dummy. I like I, I let him off the hook more than than other hosts. But people like like a Jimmy Kimmel and a Stephen Colbert. And, you know, it's just Colbert is the one who frustrates me the most, I think, because no one I don't think anyone thinks Jimmy Kimmel is smart, you know, but with Colbert, I was like, you know, you're clearly sophisticated. Like, I know that you're not a, a, a dummy and. You know, like your way with language. I think, I think you're, I think you're a smart guy, but now he's given up any pretense. I think of being a comedian. Now he's just a propagandist. At least John Stewart can still be a comedian, you know, and still make stuff funny. He did that piece on, you know, the Biden and Trump the other day, and now people hate him because he's like talking bad about Biden. It's like, well, this is what comedian. This is what yeah. these comedians should have been doing this entire time. They should have been doing it the entire time during, during the Trump years. Should have been doing it during the Biden administration. Like, it's it's comedy. Like, skewer. Yeah. All all this stuff. But but it's funny though. Like, part of me thinks that right now John Stewart is reacting to what's happening, but he got a little bit late in the game into it because there was a period where he was doing his podcast. I don't remember the exact phrasing of what he was saying, but it was very heavy in terms of the identity politics. Yeah, then it got canceled, didn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so I think that, you know, there are some people who, you know, they're boomers and they may be behind the times. They're thinking like, okay, what are the kids into? Oh, the kids are into, you know, like the identity politics and stuff like that. So, you know, I'm not saying that he's just focused on appealing to what he thinks is going to generate the most clicks obviously that's in everybody's uh, you know the back of everybody's head but uh, I do think that people do get captured by the uh, spirit of the times and like we were talking about throughout this entire conversation how do you you know how do you make sure that you don't get uh, so captured that you're just towing the line for every single talking point and you are able to think for yourself um, uh, as as far as whatever that means. And I guess that's a good place for us to uh, leave this uh, wonderful conversation. What would be your piece of advice to somebody who wants to make sure that they're not just going to be stuck in the paradigm of repeating, you know, whatever it is that they read on 4chan or, you know, whatever it is that they uh, listen to on TikTok, that they're able to actually have your own mind. I mean, that got... That gets to the bigger that gets to the bigger question of what does your own mind even mean? Do we even have our own mind? Like the people who find themselves, aren't they just like finding whatever it is that happens to appeal to them? Like even in terms of uh, meditation, there's uh, this uh, Buddhist meditation that allows you to observe. And I've had this experience sometimes where you end up finding out that you're not actually in control of your own thoughts. That the thoughts come in, and it's not like you 
are thinking them, if that makes sense. It's like they're being thought for you, and you're just receiving this information. And it goes under this whole question of willpower and, you know, how, do we have free will? Are we just like puppets that think we have free will and all that? But despite all of that, <laughs> despite all of that, if we were to assume that we have free will, what would be your piece of advice to young people right now, how they would make sure that they have a more nuanced perspective, not for the sake of being nuanced, but for actually attaining wisdom? Read. Um, you know, and not Twitter, not Reddit, um, not 4chan, not God, not 4chan. Ah, okay. Um, you know, but that's, if, if we're talking about being like red pilled, I think I was sort of softly red pilled just by reading old literature. You were read pilled. <laughs> read pilled. Ah, I was coining that one because, and I say that because, you know, when I read, um, just as an easy example, like Romeo and Juliet and you know, you see these scenes of this, you know, about 14-year-old girl arguing with her mother. They're talking about boys. And she's like, you know, her mom is like, oh, this man looks nice. And she's like, I mean, he looks nice, but I don't know if I like him like that. You know, or, you know, Romeo, who's, he comes in, he's, he's kind of whiny, but, you know, he's this maybe 15-year-old kid. And he's in love with this one girl named Rosalind, but, you know, it's some kind of whatever and then he sees Juliet and there's the danger of like the girl that you can't you're not supposed to yeah. you know have and and the tragedy of you know they're they're just they have no foresight they're, they're young and they're and they're really in love and they they think they're in love and they're passionate and the point is that when you read either history or I think literature is a great choice as well classic literature I mean Greek plays I mean these, these plays are raw bro but you see that we haven't changed that much um, technology changes, you know, civilizations kind of, uh, they come and go. But what has motivated people has largely remained the same for thousands of years. And so I think, you know, if you're reading old novels and you're reading old plays and old literature, you're, you're looking at history or you're reading biographies of people from these particular time periods and you see, oh, okay, these, per these people were also jealous. Um, you know, this person accomplished a lot. You know, this is like MLK, serial philanderer, um, accused plagiarist, and, you know, had all these character defects. Um, you know, Malcolm X, his, aut his autobiography is amazing because, I mean, he spent the first part of his life. Um, I mean, he was a good kid, but then he got into like drug dealing and, and pimping and, yeah. and, and burglary and these kinds of and crime. And then he went to prison and that's where his life turned around. And again, speaking of changing minds, like he had this rhetoric of like the white devil, but then on, after his trip to Mecca, he changed his mind again. And so once you, once you begin to just educate yourself more and you begin to understand the vast, vast um, complexity of life and of people um, and of events, I think once you develop that perspective in yourself and you develop your curiosity and your empathy, these are like two of the key cornerstones of acting actually, is curiosity and empathy. If you nurture curiosity and empathy and educate yourself and just read and just be hungry for just learning new stuff, um, I think that is the best way. Like you'll still have your opinions, you'll still have your points of view on things, you'll still have your emotions, but I think you can take a more measured perspective on on current like events past and present and um it, it'll you'll be less susceptible to falling into the trap of oh it's red oh it's blue oh it's it's hassan or it's shapiro you know what i mean it's you you, you begin to see the shades of gray more and i think it makes life more interesting because you see oh there's really smart people on this side of the argument i, I think they're kind of wrong about this you know you but there's some value in reading you know france fanon um and also in Hayek or Seoul or, you know, Edmund Burke or whatever, um, you know, they're not they're not dumb people. They might have something uh, you know, of value to offer, um, you know, but just be curious and be and and be open and exercise your will to, you know, just educate yourself as much as you possibly can. And life is just more interesting that way as well, because you see things in a broader perspective. That is a great way to end it. Um Clifton, I want to thank you so much for being here on uh, Break the Rules. And uh, where can we find more information about you and how can we help uh, donating to uh, your Thomas Soul Play project? Sure. Well, uh, the Thomas Soul Play, uh, you can go to soulplay.com. That's S O W E L L play.com. Um, 
that's the easy that's the easy uh, Earl thank you for uh, for Tom Woods for for getting that set up for for me um, I'm on Twitter at at Clifton a Duncan uh, I'm on uh, Instagram at Clifton Duncan online and finally uh, well not finally I also have a YouTube channel where that's where my podcast lives primarily is a, my, just my personal last name Clifton Duncan and I also have a substack called the state of the arts um, that is a uh, yeah, that's cliftonduncan.substack.com. I got to get better at, uh, at like plugging my stuff, man. I'm <laughs> no, so no, like, no, you're good, uh, you're good. What? Huh? Who? But uh, yeah, soulplay.com, Clifton A. Duncan, Clifton Duncan Online, Clifton Duncan, cliftonduncan.substack.com. <laughs> I made it really <laughs> easy to remember <laughs> where you can find me. And uh, guys, you could find me at levpo on Twitter, L-E-V-P-O. And be sure to like, subscribe, Click that bell. The bell is extremely important for the algorithm. So is the like. Add a comment. Share this to all your friends, cats, dogs, uncles, whatever. And patreon.com slash break the rules. Become a patron today. $20 patrons. If you guys are around New York City, I'm going to be having various events, various parties that I'm going to be throwing, meetups, dinners. And I would love for you guys to uh, come by. And uh, yeah, and the $5 people get a lot of good stuff too. MB3s of the episodes after they come out. Q&As with some of the wonderful people that we have here. And uh, yeah, until next time, Clifton, it's been a great pleasure to have you here. I would love for you to uh, come back again in uh, BTR NYC. Hey man, thanks a lot, Lev. It's been a pleasure.